Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. Are you ready for the last days? Are you walking in the character of Messiah? Are you exemplifying the power of the Holy Spirit in your life? Now, all these things God has been instructing us that He wants us to demonstrate in order that we will have a proper testimony in and through our life, that people might see Messiah and His purposes being displayed in our behavior. Now, we're not saved by behavior, but our behavior is very important to God. It is foundational for our ministry. That is the work that we've been called to do. Well, take out your Bible and look with me to John's Gospel and chapter 16. The Gospel of John and chapter 16. Now, at the end of last week's study, Messiah began speaking about the Comforter. That is, that wonderful counselor who gives us truth. In fact, he's called the Spirit of Truth. And now we're going to see how we, by means of the Holy Spirit, can live in this world and be his faithful followers. Now, it's one thing to follow him when everything is easy, when the, the, the world is uh, tolerant of our faith. But what the scripture reveals is this, that in the last day, the world is going to become very intolerant of truth, biblical truth. The world is going to have great tolerance for everything else other than the purposes, the plans, the truth of Almighty God. And we are going to be called at that time to bear testimony. And unless we walk into the Spirit, unless we're motivated by the love of God, unless we are obeying the commandments of God, that testimony is not going to be manifested through us. So are you going to have a testimony that fails God's truth or a testimony that manifests His truth in your life? Well, look with me to chapter 16, the Gospel of John, and verse 1. Messiah is speaking, he says, these things I have spoken to you. And that phrase, I have spoken, means not just now or just in the past, but over and over. See, so much of what Messiah says, he repeats in order to emphasize how important it is. So, verse 1, these things I have spoken to you in order that you will not be, and most Bibles will say, offended. Now, it's the word that we get the English phrase, scandal. And what he doesn't want us to be is shocked. Usually, a scandal is shocking. So we have to put these two concepts together. That is, of an offense, we're not called to be offended by these things, meaning that. It doesn't surprise us. See, a person is only offended when that person is, is surprised. He's shocked by what is said. But if you understand that nature, I'll give you a, an account of something. I was with a group of people, and uh, we had a funeral to do. And one of the people, well, he wanted to wait a little bit longer because he wanted to receive something. We were at a restaurant eating, and uh, he wanted dessert because it was free to him because it was his birthday. What happened? Well, we needed to live, leave. The restaurant was busy. And he said, I'll, I'll catch up. Well, the funeral began. He took a part in that funeral. And we began. His time for his part had come. He wasn't there. And I was able to just uh, delay and, and supplement some things until he came. Now, people, other people, they were so offended by his behavior. But see, I knew him very well. 
I was not surprised at all. It didn't surprise me. It didn't shock me. I wasn't offended. Now, I don't think it was right, but I wasn't offended by that because he was simply behaving as I knew he would. Well, in this same way, we ought not be shocked or scandalized by the world's response to us. We ought not be offended because why? Messiah said, it's going to happen. We need to understand his prophetic truth and believe that it's going to happen. He said several times, we are going to be hated by the world. So don't be offended. Don't be shocked. It's not scandalous to you. When it happens, we should expect it and know it's just a matter of time before the world in a very violent, in a very persecution, in a matter of persecution comes against us. So he says, verse 1, these things I have spoken to you in order that you should not be offended for they're going to do something. They are going to throw you out of the synagogue. Now, the synagogue at this time was, was a community center. Primarily, the place of worship was the temple. And if you weren't worshiping in the temple, oftentimes people would gather outside in groups. didn't have to be a specific location. The synagogue was a community center, and on Shabbat and on Mondays and Thursdays, in a unique way, the Torah was read at those times in those locations. So here, the term synagogue, well, it's part of the community. So he says, you're going to be excommunicated from the community. You're going to be cast out of, of, of your society because of your faith. Don't be offended by that. There's coming a time, that is the hour is coming, in order that all who kill you will think that they are performing service to God. Now, that's pretty intense. Because of our faith, we are going to be persecuted to death. And let me tell you, that is happening. This is being recorded in the end of August 2017. And let me tell you, in the year 2017, more people have died for their faith in Messiah than in, 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 in recent years, in, in modern time period. Meaning we can see these words being fulfilled. Persecution is growing. People are being killed. And they are thinking to their God that they're doing service. And it's only going to get worse as the last days approach. Understand, much of what Messiah is saying is not being said simply for his time period and the epoch of time that follows after his ascension back into the heavens. No, this has to do with the last days. So there's coming an hour that all who kills you will consider, they will think, they will reckon that they are performing service unto God, verse 3. And these things they do to you because they do not know the Father nor me. Now, this is the third time he has said that if someone doesn't know the Father, they won't know him. And if you don't know him and receive him, you won't have any covenantal relationship with the Father. So he's talking about this unity between him and the Father, this oneness. Now, we need to be careful. Even though God the Father and God the Son are one in purpose, and one cannot love one and hate the other, but understand there is that concept of the Trinity. God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, God the Son. So they're one, but they're also three. In this passage, we see in verse 3, and all the ones who do this to you, it says it's because they do not know, literally, they do not know the Father nor me, verse 4. But these things I have spoken to you in order that whenever that hour should come, you remember them because I have said them to you. So he wants us, when this persecution to come, remember this scripture. Remember what he's promised. And remember why they're doing it, because they do not know God. They are apart from him. And the only message that we can give is a message of reconciliation. There are going to be some at those times who are in darkness, when they hear the truth, they're going to step into the light. See, this time of persecution is going to be 
a great opportunity to share our faith and to document that faith as real. And therefore, it's going to pull others out of darkness. They're going to see the love of Messiah in and through us as we suffer for our faith in order to be able to share the words of life with them. So it's very important that we see that God's going to use this persecution for His purposes. Look on to, to verse, verse 4 in the middle where He says, And the hour is coming that whenever these things happen, you are to remember them because I have told you that. For these things to you uh, from the beginning I have spoken that you shall remain with me. Now, this concept, you remaining with me, you know what that is? If we would just look at that and say, Rabbi, what does this mean for a person to be with God? You know what he would say? Redemption. Redemption is always about us being with God, Him being with us, this unity. So this has a purpose. This persecution is for redemption. So the message of redemption, this gospel, can be proclaimed. Verse 5, but now I go away to the one who sent me. Now he's going to begin speaking about how this unity is between him and his father in a very unique way. He's going to say over and over how he's going back to the father, the one who sent him into this world that he's on assignment and we, if we're his followers, if we're his servants, if we're his disciples, we should also understand our call to serve him, that we're on assignment. Verse 5, but now I go away to the one who sent me, and none of you, none from you, should ask me, where are you going? Now, why does he say that? Because if someone says, well, listen, I don't know where you're going. That is saying, I don't know who you are. When he says, I'm going away, back to my Father, what he's meaning here is I'm going back to where I have eternally been. And that is with God. With God, intimate with Him. As the eternal Son of God. As the second member of the Trinity. So when they were to ask, they should ask, where are you going? It is a statement that they do not understand His identity. And when we don't understand his identity, you know what? We have not received the gospel. Because a proper receiving of the gospel demands that we have a right understanding of the identity of Messiah. If we think that he's just some great teacher, if we think that he's just some prophet, we do not know him and we have not received the gospel. Well, move to verse 6. He says, But because these things I've spoken to you, that your sorrow should be full of your heart. That is, your heart will be full of sorrow. He says, I've said these things, and that's what is going to come about. But realize, it is temporary. Yes, we're going to have sorrowful times. Yes, we're going to be weighed down with all this persecution and these things that we're going to be beholding in the last days, seeing, witnessing. And he says, once more, but because these things I've spoken to you, your heart is going to be full of sorrow. But I say the truth to you that it is, and he uses the word, more beneficial, more, more of a benefit. It has a greater profit, he says. But I tell you the truth, it is beneficial that, that I should go away from you. For if I do not go away, this, this comforter, this counselor, he will not come to you. But if I go away, he says, I will send him to you. Now, this word for, for beneficial, this word which is profitable is another way to translate it. We will never be profitable in the things of God. Our faith will not benefit others, nor ourselves, unless our faith is empowered and illuminated by the Holy Spirit. In this passage of Scripture, he is going to begin to make the case how dependent, absolutely dependent we are upon the work of the Holy Spirit in our life. And that Holy Spirit is only going to be released and sent by Him to us 
if he departs from this place. So that's why he says, look at verse 7. He says, I tell you the truth, that it is beneficial for you in order that I go away. For if I don't go away, the counselor will not come to you. But if I go away, I will send him to you. And that one will come and he will convict or reprove the world. Now, every place, and it's interesting, because this is the first thing that he's saying about the Holy Spirit in chapter 16. And what is that? that he is going to convict or reprove the world. What does that mean? He is going to speak against the character of this world. He is going to say that this world is in opposition to the truth of God, that its works are evil. And how is that Holy Spirit going to work? He's going to speak these things through us. We're going to have a ministry of reproach. We're going to condemn this world that meaning its activities, its behavior. So whenever this one comes, he is going to reprove the world concerning sin, concerning righteousness, and concerning, concerning judgment. Now remember those three things, concerning sin, concerning righteousness, and concerning judgment. Well, how should we understand this? Well, a few uh, months ago, I began a series on the book of Genesis. And when we look at Genesis, we find a very important word that begins that in that first chapter. And that is the word lehavdil in Hebrew, which means to make a distinction. It is to show a difference between. Now you'll note it says that God said, let there be light to make a distinction between light and darkness. So throughout this chapter, first chapter of Genesis, we come across that word to make a distinction. And one of the purposes of the book of Genesis in those early chapters is to teach us God's creation, that we need to learn how to make a right distinction between right and wrong, good and evil. And who does that in our life? Well, who's mentioned in that first chapter very early on in order that this distinction can be made? <laughs> You've got it the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God. So it shouldn't be surprising to us that God is telling us that the first thing that the Holy Spirit's gonna do in our life is give us a spirit of discernment, that we can make a distinction between that which is right and wrong, and because we have the ability to make that distinction, our behavior, the things that we do, are gonna reflect that truth. So he says, concerning sin, we're going to speak against sin. Concerning righteousness, we're going to say what's right. So it's that same purpose, what's right and what's wrong. And because there is right and wrong, there is also, he says this last word, judgment. Now, judgment has a twofold purpose. Judgment rewards righteousness and it destroys sin. I want to say that again. Judgment is not always a bad thing. In fact, it is through God pouring out His judgment, His wrath upon this world, that the kingdom of God is going to be the outcome of that, a great thing. So judgment is, is always in accordance with, if it's God's judgment, it's always in accordance with His purposes. And concerning sin, He's going to destroy it. Concerning righteousness, He's going to reward it. His judgment is coming. And notice what He says, in this passage. Once more, verse, verse oh, let's look at verse 8. And that one shall come and reprove the world concerning sin, concerning righteousness, and concerning judgment, because of sin that they do not believe in me. Now isn't it interesting? When we talk about sin, I mean, we could think about all these horrible things that people can do all those violations of the commandments of God. But he only says one thing here when he speaks of sin, because this is foundational. God knows we can never be set free of all those sins until we receive the gospel. So when he speaks here about uh, earlier on in that previous chapter, when he says, you know, they don't have any covering for their sin because I have spoken to them. 
What's he speaking about? The words of the gospel. And this condemnation, this judgment of sin is based upon one sin. And what is that? The rejection of the gospel. That is the greatest sin that a person can commit. So let me ask you, have you received that gospel? Have you been wise enough and humble enough to, to admit that you have violated the purposes of God? That you have sinned? and you are willing to ask forgiveness and trust in the blood of Messiah, His death upon that cross, in order to be the instrument of forgiveness. And that forgiveness will come about through redemption, which causes you. Redemption is an accounting term. It shows a change of ownership, where we become owned by God, He purchases us, and we are His possessions. And it says that He will never leave us nor forsake us. And He's going to be working in our life through just what He says here, the Holy Spirit. So concerning sin, because they did not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, that I go away to the Father, and they shall not perceive me. Concerning judgment, because the prince of this world has been condemned. Now, he's saying two things here. He's going to go away. What's this righteousness? What does it have to do with him going away? Well, here's the answer. For us to begin to show God's truth in our life. And this righteousness is called for us to be showing the world. Remember what it says? It says earlier, that the Holy Spirit, He's going to come, He's going to testify, and we are going to testify as well. Why? Because that's how He testifies. And now in this passage, go back up, concerning righteousness, because to the Father I go away, and you will no longer perceive me. Verse 11, concerning judgment, because the prince of this world has been condemned. And it's very interesting. That word, has been judged or been condemned, does not speak about a future reality, but one that has been accomplished in the past. That, that prince of this age has been convicted. He has been judged already. The only thing that's left in the future is for that judgment to be displayed upon him, and he will find that judgment. Well, move on. He also says, verse 12, Yet uh, uh, many shall say to me that uh, I have many more things. Messiah is speaking. He says, yet many more things I have to speak to you, but you are not able now. Now, what's he speaking about? Well, very simply, that, that these disciples have not matured enough. They are not at this time recipients of the Holy Spirit because Messiah has not died rose, ascended, and given His Holy Spirit. So at this time, they cannot bear what He wants to tell them. So in this passage of Scripture, He says, uh, many more things I have to say to you, but you are not able to bear them now. But whenever that one comes, and who is that one? The Spirit of truth. He will guide you in all truth. Now, I mean, we can't look at this passage and come away with any other interpretation that there's a connection between the Holy Spirit and truth. Remember Pontius Pilate, what did he say? What is truth? What does that mean? He says, you know, it really doesn't matter what truth is, it's a matter what, what man decides, those who are in power. That's, that's a false statement. And no one would be more willing to say that, that that's false, than the man who said that, Pontius Pilate, right now. Because he is experiencing the outcome of, of not allowing truth to, to impact his life. So let me ask you a question. Are you allowing truth to impact your life? Do you see the Spirit of God, that Spirit of truth, leading you in His ways? And one of the things that the Holy Spirit is going to do is this. When you determine to walk in obedience to the leadership, the guidance of the Holy Spirit, that's what it says here, He will guide you in all truth. 
When you submit to that guidance, you know what's going to happen? He is going to give you revelation. He is going to, as you walk in obedience to truth, you are going to see things from God's perspective. And seeing that is going to be an encouragement. Knowing the truth is going to give you power and you're going to be successful, prosperous in the will and the purposes of God. In other words, you're going to bear much fruit. You're going to have many good deeds that testify of your faith and leads others to praise God. And that's what we're called to do. So verse 13, he says, Whenever that, that one comes, the Spirit of truth, he will guide you into all truth. For it is not he that speaks of himself, but whatever he should hear, he will speak. For the things are coming, there are things coming that he will proclaim to you. Now, when he says there are things coming, we need to understand that not just only in the immediate time after Messiah's earthly ministry ends and he ascends back up into heaven. But this word coming usually has to do with the last days. I want to share again. There are many places in this scripture in John chapter 16, which has their clearest fulfillment, not in the past, but in the future. And that which is coming. So he says here in this section that we're looking at, look on. He says in this passage that there are things coming that we need to be ready for, things that we need to be prepared. Verse 13 at the end, and the things that are coming, he will proclaim to you, verse 14, that that one will glorify me because not of himself or, or because out of me he shall receive and he will proclaim. So what he hears from me, he's going to proclaim. Now, how's he doing that? Well, through us that is we are going to be the mouthpiece of the holy spirit and what the holy spirit is receiving from messiah he is going to manifest through you and me but only if we have a desire to walk in that truth if we have the desire to submit to his will that we want to receive his love and embrace that love and share it with others only then are we going to be vessels of the holy spirit that bring about truth being revealed to the world. If you're not interested in doing that, then are you really a disciple of Messiah? Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel.